Welcome to the Roundhouse Podcast with Paul Solentrop of Wichita State University Strategic Communications. We appreciate your time. Our guest is Shocker baseball interim coach Lauren Hibbs. Lauren is a former Shocker outfielder, played on the 1982 College World Series runner-up team. He was an assistant coach at Wichita State from 1985 to 1992, head coach at Charlotte from 1993 to 2019. Lauren is going to get us ready for the season. The Shockers are just a few weeks away from opening up practices in mid-January. They play at Long Beach State on February 17th to get things going. We will talk about the coaching transition and how the coaching staff, how Athletic Director Kevin Saul and the Athletic Department is helping the Shockers through this time of transition. We'll talk about fall baseball, talk about returners, people such as Brock Rodden, Chuck Ingram, and others, and how they improved and progressed during the fall. We'll talk about newcomers, uh, center fielder Kite McDonald, pitcher Clark Candiotti are two of the newcomers who made a good impression. We will go through Lauren's favorite uniform combinations. Shockers have a lot of uniforms to choose from. And we wrap up with some 1991 nostalgia. If you remember how fast infielders Billy Hall and Chris Wimmer were, we're going to talk about those days for just a few minutes. Once again, thank you for listening to the Roundhouse Podcast. Here's interim baseball coach Lauren Hibbs. So Lauren, thanks for your time. And we can start by acknowledging this is a difficult time for the student athletes to go through a a transition at this time of year. It's important for Wichita State to help them. So describe what is your, how how are you helping the the student athletes go through this? How is Wichita State's athletic department helping them get get comfortable? Well, as you alluded to, uh, it's, it's been very challenging and there's no playbook for how to deal with a situation like this. Um, you know, I think it starts at the top, and, and, and Kevin has, you know, he's had a lot on his plate here the last few weeks. Uh, his leadership has been really good with our staff and with our players in terms of the communication. He's done everything that he told us he was going to do, uh, and that's very much appreciated. Uh, I think at the end of the day, it's all about being student-athlete-centered. And, you know, um, that's the way we've done things for a long time. I think that aligns with what Kevin has brought to the table here the first five or six months that he's been on the job. And everything that we're going to do is going to be student-athlete-centered. And our, our young people have been asked to do a lot here in the last eight or nine weeks on top of you know, their schoolwork, on top of you know, individual workouts, on top of weightlifting you know, at varying times during the day, whether it be early morning or afternoons or whatever. And we've been very cognizant of that. Now, uh, with all that being said, uh, we have a good plan. You know, we've done this before. So we have a good plan with our guys and just continuing to build those relationships with our players, making sure that, that they are in the best spot that they can be in. We're, we're blatantly honest with them as to about what's going on and, and provide them information that we're allowed to provide them and, and we're able to provide them. And it's been really good. It has been really good. You know, the first several weeks were a little bit challenging, you know, when everything kind of happened. Um, but it's been really good and, and, and really fortunate here in, in the fact that, that, you know, Mike Pelfrey got a great relationship with him so as pitching coach. Mike Sirianni does a tremendous job here with our recruiting. And then, you know, Connor Behrens is also an assistant coach here in Nate Briscoe. So having that support staff along with Lottie Talbot, our administrative assistant, um, you know, we, we, we have a system we kind of put in place where they check in with Lottie every day when the kids come in the door. She gets a good feel. She's kind of like mom to all of them anyway. And it sounds like a little thing, but then all of our offices are here and, and just being in the locker room, uh, having additional team meetings, uh, you know, doing, adding those things. We had a lot of individual meetings with our players, you know, and just communicating with them about where we're, uh, trying to, to go with this program. And then once the decision was made and, and Wichita State made the decision, um, you know, with with the situation, then uh, we've kind of sped that up now here the last few days. So it's an ongoing process. The hard thing was, you know, we met with them and then they left. <laughs> you know, they were pretty much done with finals and, and they're all gone now until, until January. So, but it does give us time to be able to um, you know, to adjust some things. And, and again, at the end of the day, you know, it's our jobs to, to get the most out of our student athletes, make sure that, that they're put in a position to be successful. And I think when you build those relationships with players and with kids, like we've done for, for a long time, 
that allows you to coach them tough, which is another deal because it's it's going to be hard in the spring. You know, if you've looked at our schedule, which I'm sure you have, uh, it's we play a really challenging, aggressive schedule, and we're going to continue to do that moving forward. Uh, in order to do that, we have to have relationships with our players to where we can really be hard on them at times to prepare them for what's coming. And I think that we're building that base, and our kids have been receptive in these early workouts or in these uh, actually these November workouts that we've done. And I think that it's a you know it's a very clear. We've sent a clear message to them that it's going to be it's going to be difficult when they come back in January. But that's what we got to do uh, to get ready to play and get ready to compete. You mentioned Kevin Saul and uh, the athletic director at Wichita State. What, what was his message when he spoke with the with the team and the staff? Supportive. You know, um, basically, you know, when, when Kevin uh, approached me initially uh, early on in the process and asked me to do the interim, and it was a shorter time frame, and then he approached me again and asked me to continue to, to move forward. And, you know, just the, po- the, the feedback's been so positive. You know, just there was an eight-week period there where he had a lot on his plate, and he still does. He's got his regular responsibilities as AD, which is challenging, and then this on top of it. And, you know, just the trust that he's shown in me and the trust he's shown in us, it's just he, he hadn't had to worry about anything here, you know, because we're going to do it the right way. And... And, uh, you know, to extend that on uh, further, um, you know, I, I bleed black and gold, man. <laughs> I mean, let's be real about it. I'm a shocker. I mean, this is um, – I was in the same position several years ago, you know, when playing for Coach Stevenson that these kids are in right now. Now, there's things and circumstances here that, that we didn't have to deal with when I was playing that are challenging right now. But I've sat in the same seat that they've sat in. Are sitting in right now, and uh, you know, just just fortunate that we have uh, an athletic director that's trying to do the right thing, and fortunate that we have staff members that are that are committed to helping our student athletes, and and our kids want to be good. They they want it. They want to do well. So um, we're excited about you know the challenge moving forward in the spring, and and we'll see see where it goes to. So you mentioned the challenging schedule that starts on September, February 17th. Uh, you start out at Long Beach State in that big old Blair Field and the <laughs> acres and acres of, of outfield space there. That starts a six-game road trip. Shockers open at home on March 3rd versus Oakland. Uh, we'll remind people uh, Shockers have a good base of returners for the top hitters, people like Brock Rodden, Sire Thornhill, uh, Jordan Rogers, Chuck Ingram are all back. Some mainstays of the pitching staff, such as Peyton Tully, Caden Favors, Cameron By, they're among the prominent returners on that staff. Take us through the timeline about how things get ramped up and, and starting back in the spring. Yeah. Um, we're coming off of a challenging year last year, you know, and, and um, we've got to, we got to be able to to get the most out of our players. Um, to be able to do that, uh, we've got to put together a really good plan, which we, we've, we've already started with that between now and the time they come back. The first time we can see them is January 15th. Now they can come back and do workouts on their own per NCAA rules, and we're, we're fortunate here. We've got incredible facilities, as you know. Um, the work that's been put in here by a lot of people to – you know, from Gene to Brent to, to a whole lot of boosters in between to, to provide facilities for us where our guys can come back and they can get their work done on their own before we're able to, to meet with them on the 15th. we got to be very clear with what we're going to do, you know, and, and have had some initial discussions with with, with Pelf and, and with Siri and, and with our staff just as to how we're going to go moving forward and what we're going to prioritize and how we're going to do it based on the roster that you did a really good job of going over. So uh, we'll have a good plan. Um, you know, it's uh, we're not playing any, any uh, you know, Dickie V terminology, any cupcakes. You look at our schedule and it's, you know, a lot of programs that can say, well, we can maybe start a freshman, you know, a starting pitcher on a Tuesday and we're playing midweek and it's, it's you know, something we can ease them into. Well, our midweeks are Oklahoma, Oklahoma State, KUK State, uh, Oral Roberts got a tremendous program, um, so uh, you know we've just got to be able to to get our guys in position and prepare them the best way so we can uh, go out and compete that first Friday. 
When we talked earlier this week, you mentioned uh, instituting some standards, some items yeah. you've used dating back to your time when you were a, an assistant coach here, uh, things you developed while you were at, at Charlotte. Uh, tell us a little bit about those plans. Been really fortunate uh, to connect with some some people that are you know top end people in the leadership field over the years, and uh, from Jeff Jansen to others, and you know just um, have always tried to learn. You know, even now today. You know, just trying to learn how we can be more efficient and, and do things at a higher level. And I think the more clear that you can be with your direction of, of the program and how you're going to go about things, you know, the better chance you have to, to eliminate all the clutter that there can be. And there's a lot more clutter now than there was even 10 years ago with these kids. You know, the first thing is just developing a vision. And, you know, our vision is going to be to make this baseball program the best program in the AAC. And it's pretty clean, it's pretty simple, but that's the vision. Now, when we say the best program in the AAC, that's, that's with our on-the-field performance, that's with our academic performance, that's with our performance in the community. That's what we're trying to do and trying to accomplish. Um, in order to do that, we have to have things in place. You have to have the right people. We have to have resources. We've got a lot of those things that are already in place here. So that's, that's going to be a pretty clean, simple deal. And then it's about developing core beliefs. And, you know, taking stuff that, that, you know, I learned when I was playing and coaching here with Gene um, to stuff that I got from, you know, from Ron Polk and Gary Ward and, you know, Norm DeBryan and, and Elliot Avent and a whole lot of tremendous coaches, you know, over the years that, that I've had a chance to be able to build relationships with. So uh, those core beliefs, it's not going to be dictated from our staff or from me. There's going to be things that are going to be non-negotiables. You know, communication is a huge deal for me. We've got to be able to talk to these kids. We've got to be able to relate to them and staff members. You know, uh, varying things like being on time and being consistent with your habits. But we're also going to utilize input from our players as to what they want this program to be, you know, and build that communication. That's been really successful for us, you know, over the 27 years that I was a head coach at Charlotte. And uh, then it's, you know, then it's just a matter of, you know, providing, um, you know, some, some guidance as to what those standards are going to be. Okay, we've developed our core values. We know what our vision is. And then what are our standards going to be? And that's every day. That's, that's where most people fail, I think, in from, from doing this for an extended period of time. Most people fail. They, they can put all the stuff on paper. They can do the PowerPoints. They can do all these cool things, which is, which is great. But at the end of the day, you've got to be able to, to hold people to a standard every single day. And that's hard sometimes. You know, as a leader, that's hard, you know, when, when you're having tough communications with people. But, you know, what we found, what I found is, is if you take the time to communicate, communicate clearly with, with your players, that builds the relationship, which allows you to coach them hard. Because we're going to coach our guys hard. You know, this, this notion that these kids nowadays that, you know, you have to be softer on them, you have to do – yeah, it's different than it was, and we've evolved and we understand that. I've got a 23-year-old daughter, so I get all that stuff, you know. But at the end of the day, we still have to be able to coach them hard, and they have to be uh, willing to accept some constructive criticism. They have to be willing to work on things that they don't do well, to use a Gene Stevenson line. Um, and we're going to do all those things. Now, when they do something well, we're going to compliment them. Uh, but we're going to be very clear on what's expected of them every day. Uh, and we're going to, uh, as leaders, you know, as coaches, as a head coach, as assistant coaches, we're going to do everything we can to impact those, those people and those young people in a positive way every day. So take us through fall baseball and the, and the Shocker World Series. You had some scrimmage games with some outside competition. Uh, overall impressions of the of the yeah. Shockers from the fall and, and what you learned and what this team improved on? Well, really kind of jumped into the head coaching role that last four or five days. So, um, you know, been in, in an administrative role, you know, as everybody knows. And, and um, so kind of evaluating things in maybe a different light, you know, that last week leading into the individual workouts. But, Man, it's fun to play outside competition. <laughs> you know, we've talked about that a little bit. It's you, you kind of you kind of get beat down. There's 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 things that you can do to try to motivate them to keep them motivated, and and you know by playing inter squad scrimmages. But it's just it's pretty challenging sometimes. So 
to be able to play, you know, the three outside opponents that we played. And, you know, the, the guys at Cali, uh, you know, I've known Lefty and, and those guys, uh, their coaches, I've known them for forever. And I even, re- I even reached out to Dave, you know, Burroughs, who's a longtime coach there who retired a few years ago, and just said, hey, you know, what What do you think? What do you see? What? And that's been that's been great to have that relationship. As you know, we've, kept, we've had players from Cali and, you know, we had a lot of players from Cali that played for us at Charlotte. So just getting that feedback and, and uh, you know, with Pittsburgh State and then with the team that we played from Canada. So it was good. It's good to, to put our guys, you know, in uniform and, and have them play against, you know, um, outside competition. And we learned a lot. And, uh, you know, we've started, like I said, the last week of, of fall practice and, and in the individual sessions, we've started addressing, addressing some of the things that we've seen that, that we need to work on. What would you like best about what you saw from the Shockers? Our guys want to do well. They, they want to be good. Now, um, there's a process you got to go through to give yourself a chance to be good. And, you know, when we met with them that last time before they left to go home for, for, um, for break, uh, we told them, you know, get your work done. Because the, the first part in the process is uh, you've got to continue to get in the weight room. You've got to get your throwing program done that, that Coach Pelfrey's given to our pitchers and that, that series given to our position players. You've got to continue to get your swings in. You've got to get your conditioning done because you've got to commit and be mature enough to get your work done over this next four, five, six-week period to give ourselves a chance to be a good team. If, if that's not taken care of and if they don't do the work that's necessary – then we're going to be even further behind. It's going to make it really challenging. And as you know, you alluded to it. I mean, we're, we're biting off a, a huge chunk. We're jumping right in the fire by playing at Long Beach State the first three games. You know, California schools and warm weather schools are always ahead of colder weather schools. That's just the reality. But we're going to get prepared, and we're going to go out there, and we're going to compete. But part of the process here for our players is to be mature enough and understand, and they've been communicated with, you've got to get your work done over the break. And you got to you got to be ready to come back here and and and, and compete. And we've put a, a system in place that we've used in the past that that's really worked well for us. Well, I will reach out to our players periodically. Coach Sirianni will reach out to our players. Our our strength staff, you know, Coach B will reach out to them. Coach Pelfrey, our entire staff will be involved with with just checking in with our players to make sure, you know, and trying to hold them accountable to get their work done and and be ready to come back here and and uh, get to work on the 15th of January. Yeah, that's a unique thing about baseball, I guess, and softball, where you coach them during the fall for an extended period, and then you lose some amount of contact, day-to-day contact with them for a, yeah. a significant period. A lot can happen over the you know three or four weeks of break. Has people staying in good baseball shape, has that been helped over the last 15 years as more kids have access to indoor facilities and batting cages yeah. and things like that? So what happens is all these kids go back to what you're saying. They go back to their indoor facilities, their travel ball facilities. And, you know, we've got kids from Wisconsin. We've got kids from Texas. We've got kids from Oklahoma. We've got kids from Kansas. And what happens is all these kids go back. They have an opportunity to work out at these facilities, but they're working out with kids that are playing at other schools, whether it be Michigan, Minnesota, Texas, Texas a and Oklahoma, Oklahoma State, KUK State, they have a chance to, to kind of go back and work with, with them, um, which is pretty cool. You know, now that leads to conversations, you know, about how you're doing this, how you're doing that, you know, how are your coaches there at Wichita State, how are your coaches here there. It leads to a lot of things, which I think are positive, you know, that they can have that, that feedback and communication. Um, you know, we've made an adjustment over the last probably five, six, seven, eight years in that when they come back, I'll have meetings with certain players and encourage our, our, our assistants to, like, hey, was there something that, that maybe you had a conversation with somebody that's playing at, you know, Mississippi State or playing at Oklahoma that maybe they did something a little different in the fall that maybe we can implement, you know, and try to learn from our players. Again, build that communication with them, continue to build that relationship with them and provide them input. And then also utilize our staff in the, in the context that we have uh, with trying to just find ways to do things better and put our guys in a better position to be successful. 
Tell us about some of the returners who maybe made a, made some strides or made a good impression in the fall. Who should people maybe be paying well, attention yeah, to? Yeah, everybody's going to focus on you know on our three guys that were all conference from last year, and and you know they've earned that. And you know Brock Rodden's kind of the first one on the list, and man, we love that guy. A Shocker fans should love that guy. He is a throwback, just get after it, competitive chip on his shoulder every day type player. And, um, you know, I think he, he really worked hard this fall at becoming better defensively. Um, Coach Sirianni does a good job with our infielders, and, and there were some things that were addressed. And if, if people notice, we, you know, he played quite a bit at shortstop this fall, which he's got the ability to do that if we choose to move that direction. Uh, but just a, a worker, you know, it was – our last the last week of, of fall after we had kind of made that transition from a coaching staff standpoint and and you know I saw him in the dugout I saw Brock in the dugout and he was mad and he's like I got to go get some more swings in the indoor you know well you know it's the last week of fall practice you know I mean he's he was drafted last year he's a returning All Conference player you know most guys you know or some guys would have just shut it down I got I got three more inner squads and it's not that big a deal he wasn't that way. And he lit it up the last two or three, you know, inner squads. So that's just the type of mentality he brings, and and he's obviously going to be a centerpiece of what what we're doing moving forward. Hi, this is Rick Muma, president of Wichita State University. Check out the latest episode of the Forward Together podcast. Each episode, I sit down with different guests from Shocker Nation to celebrate the vision and mission of Wichita State University. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Chuck Ingram had a really nice year last year for you in the outfield. Tell us about his fall. Yeah, he uh, had a good year for us last year, as, as you alluded to. And uh, Coach Sirianni and I and Coach Barons met with, with with Chuck, you know, before he left to go home for the for the break. And one of the things that he brought up was, you know, he felt like that he learned uh, from stro- he struggled in the in the Cape. You know, it's a tremendous league. Um, he went up there and coming off a, a good year here and and struggled but to his credit he stayed the whole summer he worked through it he didn't tap out he didn't come home he didn't you know kind of whine around and and I think that 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 shows a lot about what he wants to be as a player I think uh, we tried to adjust uh, some things here the last few weeks you know in terms of helping him become a better hitter and and uh, we fully um believe that he's got a chance to continue to improve moving forward. I mean, it's for him, it's all about putting the ball in play. He's so strong and got such tremendous bat speed. It's just about putting putting the ball in play. And when he does, even with two strikes, if it's a you know an 80% swing just to try to get the barrel there, the, you know, the ball usually comes off his bat with a really high exit, you know, velocity speed. So, and then, you know, people are going to focus on Cameron by, you know, Cameron was a all conference player for us, had a, had a little bit of a uh, medical issue with his arm that, that wasn't major, but had to be uh, kind of cleaned up this this fall. Uh, so we did not throw him this fall. He he set out, uh, got that taken care of, and all indications are, uh, you know, with his throwing program that he just started, he's going to be maybe a little bit behind at the start of the season with his pitch count and the number of pitches he's going to be able to throw. But uh, knock on wood, hopefully back to, to a full recovery and, and can be one of the centerpieces of our pitching staff. So Brock Rodden hit 338 for the Shockers, 17 home runs. You mentioned he was drafted 10th round by the Oakland A's, decided to come back and continue at Wichita State. What kind of a boost is that to get a guy like that back on your roster? Tremendous. You know, he's a guy that can hit multiple spots in the order. Um, and to, to have him along with, with Ingram and Sawyer Thornhill and, you know, Jordan Rogers and, and, you know, Peyton Tolley, you know, as possible DH can. I mean, we've we've got a pretty solid core, you know, to build from from an offensive standpoint. And then, you know, some of the guys and some of the pieces that we've added. Um, you know, Kai McDonald's got a chance to be a good player. Uh, he has a skill set to play center field, which we really haven't had a true center fielder, 
you know, in the, in the time that we've been back here. But he's a guy that could, you know, possibly do that, which allows us to, to maybe, uh, you know, move Ingram to right field or left field or whatever. And, and you know, Chuck played center field for us all year last year. So when you have the ability to be able to take a really good athlete and make your, make your defense better and your outfield better, possibly, um, that's going to help us. You know, uh, Jack Little's a freshman um, that hadn't been there hadn't been much talked about him. He's a really athletic guy. You know, he's he's we think he's got a chance to be you know a shortstop or middle infielder. You know, moving forward, and he'll compete for time. You know, at that at that uh, position or those two positions. But he's a guy that can flip to the outfield as well. So, uh, and then David Herring's another guy. Just kind of running down some of the newcomers. A starting shortstop for Cali County. You know, community college. Uh, last year they finished runner-up in the JUCO World Series. I mean, he's about as solid as you get. He's a baseball player, again, kind of a throwback guy. He's going to dive for ground balls. He's going to be in the right spot. You know, he's a left-handed hitter, which which gives us a chance to kind of balance our lineup out a little bit. Um, you know, Pennington's another kid that transferred in from from Central Missouri. Uh, it's a right-handed hitter that's. You know, another guy that, you know, if, if we can get him to make consistent contact, he's got tremendous power and a guy that, you know, that's got a chance to play first base for us. Uh, Mauricio Milan's a catcher that we brought in, junior college catcher that's, you know, that played in the in the draft league this summer and uh, he's got a chance to be a good player, you know. And, and to combine him with Burge and, you know, some of the other guys from a catching standpoint that we got, we feel like that we've got a good mix of three or four guys there with, with Cooper Harrison and, you know, Williams to, to, to try to, you know, hopefully one of those guys kind of rises up above everybody else and separates themselves. Um, you know, Jordan Rogers is another guy that's, you know, that was a, developed into a consistent player that could possibly hit in the middle of the order for us, you know, really competitive guy and, and pretty good athlete. He was a he was an infielder in high school, and we kind of moved him to the outfield. He can play multiple positions. So, you know, there's there's some options. Sestro, you know, a guy that's now in his third year that's shown glimpses, and he's got tremendous raw power. You know, again, it's just a matter of trying to get him to put the barrel on the baseball more frequently. So, from a position player standpoint, um, you know, I think that people should be excited about some of the options that we have. Um, we're going to do everything we can to, to be extremely aggressive offensively. We've got to be able to hit and run. We've got to be able to play up tempo. We've got to be able to, you know, pressure opponents' defenses and opponents' pitching staffs and make them, you know, defend a lot of different things. You know, if we're a if we're a football team, we're gonna we're gonna be able to spread it out. We're gonna throw it around, and we're gonna be able to run the ball. We're gonna make them play, you know, vertically and and horizontally. I kind of reference football a lot, but. Uh, you know, same with, uh, same with, um, you know, anything that we're going to do offensively. It's going to be aggressive, and we've got to do a good enough job coaching them to where they can bunt, they can hit and run, and we've got as many options as possible so we can pressure the defense. And you know, for me, the offensively, it it kind of revolves around the fact that it's easy to score runs when the wind's blowing out and the, the pitching's not real good. The reality is, is the wind's going to be blowing in, or the pitching's going to be really good, or both. You know. So we've got to figure out a way to, to manufacture runs and, and give ourselves a chance to win games when the pitching gets really good and, and maybe the conditions aren't as conducive to hitting as, as what they may be as, as the year goes on and the weather warms up. I've done a lot of stories on people who went to the Cape Cod League over the summer, <laughs> and it seems a lot of them really benefited from it almost regardless of how they performed. That there was just something about being in that league, yeah. facing that kind of competition that really helped them. What's your experience been with guys going to the Cape and coming back, and, and why is it? Why does it seem to be generally really helpful? So the best hitting coach there is is to go out in the summer with a wood bat league and figure it out. <laughs> I mean, <coughs> it was that way for, you know, when I played here. Uh, it's, it's that way now. And, you know, there, there's, there's so many positive things about just getting away from this bubble and – and going out and and it's it's basically uh, an internship for professional baseball. I mean, let's be real. It's going to the Cape or going to the Northwoods League or going to California, like a lot of our guys do. Uh, it's it's just uh, it's an internship for professional baseball, and 
And the good thing is, is if you're in pro ball and you fail like that, you don't have a job anymore. You know, you get released. In college, you can go and you can fail or you can succeed or you can make adjustments and, and do whatever you got to do. And then you can come back and address those issues, you know, back in college. So um, just really value the guys, including Cameron By, Chuck Ingram, Peyton Tolley, you know, Sawyer Thorne. We, we got a lot of guys that that went out in the summer and – they they grinded through it. You know, a lot of these kids now, they'll go and they'll play for a couple, two or three weeks, and they tap out and they want to take the rest of the summer off. Uh, but it, to, to these guys' credit, and the majority of them, they, they grinded through it. And, you know, we haven't really talked much about our pitching staff. I know we're probably going to get into that here, here shortly. But we're, we're very careful with our pitchers and the number of innings that they throw in the, in the summer. And, and trying to monitor those things throughout the fall and, and have our best guys available for the spring. There was one more newcomer I wanted to ask about. I heard a lot of good things about Clark Candiotti, mm-hmm. one of the new one of the new pitchers over the fall. Uh, give us a, a little scouting report on Clark Candiotti. Yeah, and, and Pelf and I just uh, kind of revamped a few things yesterday and just kind of kind of communicated with what our plan is going to be moving forward. But you know, Candiotti's at the top of the list in terms of guys that perform well this fall. Uh, you know, with his dad pitching in the big leagues. I mean, he's been around it since he was born. So um, he understands the type of work ethic you have to have. He understands, you know, the, the, the type of competitive nature that you have to have. Stuff's good, but it's not off the charts crazy good. You know, he's not mid-90s like a lot of these kids are now. But it's good enough, and our guys love playing behind him, you know. Um, so he would be a guy, you know, that, that would have a chance to compete for, you know, for for a starting rotation spot. Um, you know, we got the returners, Caden Favors, and we talked about by, you know, Tolleys and other guys got a chance to, to maybe be a, a weekend starter for us. Um, you know, we're gonna gonna probably uh, train Jace Miner, who started a lot for us last year in midweeks, and and Kranz, another guy that. You know that that's had a good summer and, and had a good fall, uh, and then you kind of combine those guys with, you know, guys like Grant Adler, who was just the number one at, at Cali last year, and he's pitched in a lot of big games. He's got a chance to help us, uh, kind of blend all that stuff in with with Candiotti and, and some other guys. Um, Verco's another guy, junior college guy that from Arizona that that's got a chance to maybe work into the rotation. He's he started before. He's a strike throwing guy, and then. A young guy, you know, uh, Sneed, that is um, a high school kid from from Wisconsin. That's got a really good arm. He's he's a tremendous athlete and got a really good arm. And he's another guy that that from a stuff perspective may be able to, you know, to help us, you know, uh, as a starting pitcher. So that's kind of the breakdown of that. Um, you know, you, you also, you know, Ross is a junior college guy that, that can that can throw a breaking ball. Uh, you know, Boyer's a guy that, um, you know, that was a starter for us last year, had some arm issues, but it looks like, knock on wood, he's going to be healthy, you know, moving forward, and we got a red shirt year for him last year. Uh, Nate Adler had a good fall, you know, and, and threw well for us, and we got, you know, Wilkinson, another junior college kid out of Iowa that, that – can spin a breaking ball and, and uh, got a chance to help us, we think, you know, from a bullpen role. So um, really big on balance, you know, whether it be offensively with balance in our lineup, left and right hand of balance, really big on balance with, with our pitching staff. You know, Dillhoff's another kid, just kind of going through these things in, in my head here, but Dillhoff's another kid out of Ohio. That's a big physical left-handed pitcher that showed glimpses at times, you know, to, to help us. Um, Got another kid, Mulholland, left-hander that that was tremendous in high school, and then kind of had some arm issues, uh, missed the majority of the fall, but it looks like he's back healthy and he's got a chance to help us. So, you know, there's options. You know, it's just a matter of of again trying to prepare them the right way, um, starting you know in January, you know when they come back from the break and and kind of put the pieces together the right way. We play we play seven games to start the first the season on road trip. And uh, against challenging competition, so guys are going to get an opportunity. You know, we're we're not going to go crazy on their pitch counts. We're going to prepare them the right way and be at a at a level where they can 
uh, hopefully provide us quality innings on the front end, but guys are going to get an opportunity to pitch um, quite a bit there that first couple, two or three weeks you know, of the season. Clark Candiotti is indeed the son of Tom Candiotti, yes, a long, long-time big league pitcher that, yeah. whose, whose name people will, uh, will recognize. Uh, so, Lauren, you, were, you played at Wichita State. Uh, you worked as an assistant at Wichita State from 85 to 92 and then head coach at Charlotte from 93 to, to 2019. Let's start. Uh, what did you learn from working with Gene Stevenson that has continued to, you know, to help you throughout your coaching career? How much time do we have? Yeah, but we'll go with the, the – you know, um, And I, you know, I've stayed in communication with Gene for a long time and uh, actually had – a great conversation with him yesterday just to, you know, just to get feedback and guidance from him. And he's tre- a tremendous resource. Um, you know, just like we talked about before, you have to, you know, you have to be willing to work on the things that you don't do well. You have to be consistent with, you know, with every day. You know, you have to put kids in position to be able to be successful. You have to to work hard, you have to have a good plan, you have to communicate. All these things that we've talked about, um, you know, are things that that I learned from Gene, obviously as a player, Um, and to compete, man. You know, when I talk about bleeding black and gold and I talk about being a shocker, there's a mentality that's kind of hard to explain to people about what that means. You almost have to see it and live it and feel it. And... You know, people, when I left to go to Charlotte and, and would run into people and they're like, man, you know, we played you guys back in 1982 and this and that. And we hated playing against you guys, you know, and that's, boy, man, that makes you feel good. Um, but just that that competitive nature that you have to have to be able to play for Gene Stevenson and to be able to coach for Gene Stevenson – uh, you've got to have a, a very high level of toughness and competitive nature to be able to do that. And I, I, you know, I thank Gene for that all the time. You know, I was a young dude from Wellington, Kansas. It was a three sport athlete that needed to be taught those things. I had a great base from my dad and other people over the years, but I learned a lot from him, learned a lot from Brent, uh, learned a lot from a lot of other coaches, you know, over, over a time period and still have that resource, which I'm thankful for. Why did you get into coaching? Great question. Uh, The why for me is I had such a great experience here as a player that I wanted to give back. I wanted to give back to these players. And it's still the same today. You know, when, when, when Kevin asked me to do this initially on an interim basis, then he asked me to do it, you know, longer term. At the end of the day, it was about the players. We we want to do everything we can to help them have a similar experience to what I had. I mean, think about it. Growing up in Wellington, Kansas, and playing football and basketball, and you come to Wichita State, you get to go. I've been to Hawaii five times. I played in a national championship game. I got to play professionally, and then for Gene to ask me to come back and coach and give me that opportunity, and and the the staff that we had. And you know all the personalities. You know Gene's personality. It's, it's you know, Brent's personality, my personality. And, and to blend that together and to go through and, and, you know, the last five years that I was here as an assistant coach, we made it to Omaha four of, of the five times and, and won a national championship and finished second, you know, in 91. And, and to, to go through all that, uh, man, that's special. You know, when, when Gene got inducted into the, to the College Baseball Hall of Fame, I, I flew from Charlotte, and Gene asked me, you know, and, and several other people if we could make it, and I flew out there and was, was there for that time frame. And, you know, Skip Bertman, who I have unbelievable respect for, Skip was kind of holding court there in Lubbock, you know, and, and talking to, to, to a bunch of people, and, and he was dead serious. He said there was about a five- to six-year period there where Wichita State was the best baseball program in college baseball. And, you know, complimented me, complimented Gene, complimented Brent. And, man, I'm, I'm tingling now talking about it. You know, you get that kind of validation from a guy like Skip Bertman. And, you know, that's, that's pretty, pretty special. So, um, you know, and then to make the decision to, to leave and go to Charlotte was not easy. But um, we did that. And, and uh, I think that that was a, a big part of 
preparing me, preparing us for this situation because I got away from Wichita. I got completely away from all the stuff that's here. And uh, Brent thought I was crazy. <laughs> you know, he's like, why are you doing it? Because it was comfortable here. We had, Obviously, we were on a roll. I mean, we had it going. Uh, you know, Gene brought JT in when I left, and, and they kept it rolling, you know, for, for multiple years. And uh, But to go and, uh, you know, I don't know if people know or not, but Pat Cedeno, who played here on our national championship team, Pat was our pitching coach at Charlotte those first three years. So him and his wife, Julie, were, you know, just newly married, and he took that leap of faith too, you know, and went out there and helped us get that program at Charlotte started off really bad when we got there and, and it was, was, you know, one of the first guys to help, you know, help us start building that deal. And you, know, you think you're going to be there for three, four, five years, get it cleaned up and moved on to the next thing. And 27 years later, we were still there and working through things and, and uh, took a really bad situation and made it, made it really good and won a lot of championships and a lot of games and, and uh, then transitioned back to here. So all those experiences, all those things uh, help us now. You know, with with another challenge and something that we're, you know, we're excited about, uh, you know, moving forward. Yeah, I think that's important that you did get out of your comfort zone and go not not just leave Wichita State, but you went about as far east as you could go without, with, with still being in the United States. Was that always part of your plan? Did you recognize, you know, if I'm going to grow, I need to get out of here? I really wasn't looking to leave. You know, I mean, you know, I mean, you can get people can go back and look at the records. I mean. You make it to Omaha four out of five years, and you know you got some really good players coming back. And you know, Casey Blake was going to be a freshman. You know that that next year, and I knew his dad and all that. And I thought he had a chance to be a really good player. And Travis Wyckoff, you know, he's an Arc City kid that we you know, was involved in recruiting. And I was from Wellington. He's from Arc City, tremendous athlete. And you know, so you knew that there was uh, still still more guys coming in. Um, Two people said, hey, you know, it's time to do it. And that was my father, my dad, and Gene. Like, you know, and Gene warned me. He said, you know, he felt like it was a blessing that when he got here that there wasn't a program. He started from scratch. He said, you're going to inherit a lot of bad, you know, because the program is not very good, and that's going to be a different challenge for you. And then, you know, just having those resources once I got out there as a young head coach, and I could call Gene any time I needed to. I could call Brent any time I needed to, JT. In addition to building a whole nother uh, network of people in that part of the country, so I learned how to, you know, to talk with a southern accent a little bit. All y'all used to could. I mean, I can get down there when I need to. Uh, not as fake as the LSU football coach situation, Brian Kelly. Well, I started laughing when I saw that. I just like, come on, dude. Like, you don't have to. You don't have to go there. But uh, and just. You know, building those contacts and and still a lot of great friends that live in that area, uh, and have reached out here in the last last few days and last week or so, and just you know they want us to do well. They're excited. They want Wichita State baseball to do well. Was there anything more fun than coaching Chris Wimmer and Billy Hall and watching them when they got <laughs> on base? <laughs> Billy stops by periodically. Chris, you know, his son plays at South Carolina, so uh, just have stayed in touch with those guys, and I still joke around with them that you know. I think Jimmy Thomas and I, back in our prime, we might be able to give you guys a good run, a 60-yard dash, and they both just start laughing. But it was fun. I mean, they, they could literally outrun the ball sometimes, which sounds crazy, but uh, they were just – and both of them were – you know, Billy was undervalued. He was at Butler County, and he comes here as a walk-on, and you know, he had to grind through it and, and developed into an All-American. And Chris, I mean, I'll, I'll never forget going over and watching Chris practice at East High School – you know, and he had him, they had him and that Tommy Tillman, and, you know, uh, Llewellyn. They had several really good players. Mike Jones, was Mike on Jones that team, yeah, right? Mike yes. Jones, and and you know they had, they had a good run of, of players then. But you know, watching Chris and everybody's like, oh, you know, he's a second baseman. They were worried about his throwing motion and all this other stuff. But what a great athlete! I mean, incredible athlete. And you know, when he got here, even you know, played him at second a lot, and there was. I think maybe it was his fall before his sophomore year, and Gene, had, when Brent and I, you know, met with with Gene and his staff, and he's like, "You know, we need to play Wimmer at shortstop this fall." And I was like, "What are you talking about? He can't, you know, struggle to throw the ball across the field." But Gene was right. 
you know, let's give Chris, let's give Wimmer a chance to play shortstop every day, which freed up a chance for Billy Hall to play second. And we had maybe the most athletic tandem at, at short and second that we've had in the history of the program. Now, Lansing and P.J. Forbes were pretty good, and there's been a lot of other ones over the years, as you know. But um, just really, we were able to really speed the game up on people and, and really had a, those two guys you know, develop into All-American caliber players. That 1991 team was a lot of fun to watch. Maybe the maybe my favorite. They were, they were very, very entertaining. All right, let's wrap it up. I do a lot of podcasts in here when I come over to talk to the players, and I always we're in the baseball classroom, and there are eight uniforms hanging up on the wall. I always ask them, what is their favorite? So I'm going to ask you the same, <laughs> same question. We've got camouflage. We've got yellow with the shockers. We've got pinstripe, black, gray what they describe as the old school shocker lettering. We've got another black and another white. What, what's, what's your favorite out of all those, Lauren? Well, you remember with Gene, like we were like Oregon football back in the, in the 80s before Oregon football. Like we would wear all gold. We would wear all black. We would wear, you know, gray pant and gold top. I mean, we had, had 9,000 different, different uniform combinations. I wish that Under Armour made a gray pinstripe. How cool would that be? So to answer your question, I kind of like the pinstripe. Uh, I think that looks pretty clean. Under Armour does not right now make a gray pinstripe, so we're hopefully that they will in the next year or two. Uh, I'm I'm more of the like the clean look, like a white pant or pinstripe pant with with black top or or yellow top. Um, just keep it clean, keep it looking good, and then get that uniform dirty. With all those uniform combinations, how do you choose what you're going to wear for a game? It's a Nate Briscoe deal. <laughs> He's got to defer to him. And, you know, this whole deal about, you know, the starting pitcher's got to pick it. And I, I've never understood all those things. But I, I try to stay out of that. I, it doesn't matter to me what they wear just as long as they play hard. Thank you for listening to the Roundhouse Podcast, courtesy of Wichita State University Strategic Communications. We encourage you to rate, review, and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. You can find more Roundhouse content at GoShockers.com. It's over! It is over! Ladies and gentlemen, say it slowly and savor it. Wichita State is going to the Final Four for the first time in 48 years. Unbelievable. What a scene, folks. The Shocker fans are just going crazy in the stands. Just maybe the greatest win in the history of Wichita State basketball.